name is Oliver Morris, and I am the director, uh, one of the directors of an organization called the International National Trusts Organization, which is an umbrella body for national trusts around the world, uh, national and heritage trusts around the world, those engaged in the conservation of the cultural and natural heritage, be it tangible or intangible. And we have, we were founded in 2007. Um, we're a small organization, but with a, a, a voice that is becoming louder. And we have 62 members around the world, of which 10 are in Africa. Um, I think we've got about 10 in Europe as well. Uh, and, a, and a great many in Asia too. Um, the reason that we're here at COP21, and indeed this is the fifth COP I've been to, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old hand at COPs now, is that um, <clears throat> we feel and have felt for a long time that, that culture hasn't really been recognized as part of the, the discussions. And we feel that there is uh, a necessity to bring it rather more to the fore. Uh, the situation really is that um, culture, we lose our culture at our peril. It's, it is part of a hum our human right, really, to have that culture, to pass it on to the, the future generations. And so we feel that there is a social need, uh, we feel that there is uh, an economic need as well. And actually protecting the culture, the cultural heritage, it provides a resilience to climate change because it provides jobs, it provides, um, it provides an educational facility for kids and, and adults um, and it, it, it provides for tourism as well. So everything points, it, you know, it is very, it's a very sustainable option frankly rather than knocking down the cultural heritage and building something, in its, something new in its place. So that's, that's why we're here and um, we've actually had uh, some, some good successes this year. We had a, a side event in Paris, uh, in downtown Paris, which was organized for us by the chief executive uh, officer of US ICOMOS. ICOMOS is a, a subsidiary of uh, UNESCO. And he, uh, he, he planned this, he was in our delegation during the first week in fact, and he planned this uh, side event and he had some very good speakers uh, from uh, the University of Exeter in England. He had uh, the vice chair of the IPCC, he had a scientist from the IPCC, and he also had somebody from UNESCO itself. And myself and my colleagues in, in my, my team were also, my delegation were also uh, present and speaking. So we were able to have a, a useful discussion um, and that was followed last Saturday by uh, an event in the UNESCO Pavilion in, in the um, Climate Generations Room uh, Hall. And that was extremely useful and we made some headway there and I think that the outcome is that we will be invited to help UNESCO in putting together a paper for um, for the IPCC as part of the next assessment report, the sixth assessment report. So we feel that we've actually made some headway, uh, which is very encouraging. <laughs> so what, what about culture <coughs> needs to be recognized in climate COP and climate change negotiations? What elements of culture are important? Well, I feel very strongly that a culture that is destroyed as a result of climate change. It's lost forever. I mean, you, you have the situation, if you take an extreme example of, and a, and a very real example, I should say, of somewhere like Tuvalu or Kiribati, where the people of those islands are threatened with having to migrate to Australia or, or New Zealand, their culture is lost. Their cultural heritage is obviously lost because it's, it'll be underwater but their, the very culture of the country will be lost as well because you can't replicate a culture in a foreign land. Uh, I mean, their culture depends on their community being on an island 
uh, if you're on the outskirts of Melbourne, for example, you're not going to be able to recreate that. And I heard a very impassioned um, speech from a man called Minor Talia the other day at a side event where he was speaking on behalf of Tuvalu. And he was explaining there that uh, apparently when a baby is born, the mother buries the placenta in a hole in the ground and plants a coconut tree um, on the site so that the roots, when the child grows up, its roots are firmly planted on the island. And he said, we can't leave. And I asked the question, actually, at that side event. I said, so how do you, how do you value the loss of culture on the island? He said, the loss of culture equals death. It was a very moving moment, I must say, but it really brought it home to me. And that is, you know, that's an example. They're, they're not actually members of our organization in Tuvalu, but we do have members in the Pacific Islands, and we're hoping to have some more. But um, Fiji, for example, is, is, uh, has an organization, the Fiji National Trust, which is a member of our organization. So that's one, one example. I mean, you, you can take that a, a stage further. I was talking yesterday to somebody from Malawi, and he was saying that they're suffering terribly from extended droughts and heavier rainfalls and so on, and farming is now becoming much more difficult than it used to be, and a lot of farmers are migrating to the cities, but there's no work for them. And so what are they doing? And he painted a very vivid picture of how they were um, out of work and with nothing to do and really bored and so on and so forth. And that is, again, it's, it's, it's a loss of culture. And, and so we, we feel that this ought to be much more uh, recognized by the powers that be in, in terms of um, the negotiations. So far, are those issues coming out of COP21? Do you feel COP21 will agree on something? Do you know, I, I, I feel... I feel more optimistic about this COP than having been to five and been disappointed at everyone. I feel much more uh, optimistic about this one. I, I'm sure, I can't believe they won't reach an agreement. Whether it's the right agreement is another matter. And that, that in a way, is, is, is the issue. I mean, clearly, it would be marvellous if they agreed to a, a 1.5 degree temperature rise only. I don't think that's likely at this stage, but it, what I would like to see, even if at best they agree a 2% temperature rise, at least a facility for bringing that temperature down slowly but surely to 2050, so that by 2050 we are at 1.5 degrees and no more, and less preferably. Um, so I, feel, I do feel reasonably optimistic that something will be agreed, but as I say, whether it's the the right thing remains to be seen. I was talking actually to a member of uh, the French government today and I, I asked her that, that very question. I said, what do you think will be the end result? She said, we won't get 1.5, but we might get we might get something approaching two degrees. But there's a long way to go. And what really worries me is, again, at another side event yesterday, I heard um, the First Minister for Scotland speaking, Nicola Sturgeon, and she was saying what they've done in Scotland, and I must say it's mighty impressive. They've, they've um, reduced their emission, uh, um, carbon emissions uh, from, but by uh, 38%. They set themselves a target of 2020 to reduce them by 42%. They've already got 38%, and their target for, by the year 2050 is 80%. So they're well on the way. And we also heard um, uh, the Premier of Ontario and the Governor of Vermont speaking, and they also quoted examples of how well they're doing in terms of reducing their emissions. And in fact, it was the Governor of um, Vermont who suggested that communities, each community should be doing something positive. And in that particular uh, region, they. they actually compete, they compete, all the local communities compete to see who can do the best job on renewables. And that, if that's fed up to the governments, <clears throat> it would make their life a little easier. 
But I, I'm afraid I, there are certain governments in the industrialized world, and I've said this at previous COPs, that really are in the pockets, I'm sorry to say, of the industrialists. And I just don't think there is the willingness to give up the f subsidies they're giving out for fossil fuels because of the benefits that they receive in return. And until one gets rid of the subsidies, I'm afraid we're never going to get to 100% renewables. But my wish is that by 2050 we do. And I'm an eternal optimist, so let's hope so.